Good morning. We are going to talk about chapter nine this morning in geology. And so I'll share my screen so we'll all be on the same page. So chapter nine is on mass wasting. When we talk about mass wasting, we're referring to the erosion or the movement of large portions of the topsoil and the rock and the debris that are on the surface of the earth. Um, there are at least three major agents of erosion, water, ice, and wind. So if you have flooding, it can remove a, a lot of debris. If you have a glacier come through, that can move a lot of rocks and soil. And certainly wind in the right concentration can relocate uh, looser material. So let's look down. We classify mass wasting based on three things. How fast or slow does, it, does the material move? So that's the rate of movement. We also look at what's involved. Is it the bedrock? Is it the rock that the soil is on top of that's somehow relocated? Or is it just the surface material, just the debris that's on top of the rock? So number one was the rate of movement. Number two is the type of material. And then the third thing we classify this mass wasting by is the nature or the type of the movement. So what do we mean by that? Well, we want to know, does the material just move along the surface as a dry, loose material? If so, that's a slip. Does the material move along the surface as if it's a river of debris and mud? Well, that would be a flow. Or does it fall through the air? Does it break off somehow and plummet to a lower elevation without actually skimming the surface? That would constitute a fall. So we have flows and slips and falls, and it all depends on how the material moves to get from its starting location to its ending location. Let's look at some of the major controlling factors to mass wasting. We'll have four of them we'll focus on. So the first one we want to look at is undercutting the slope. You see this in a variety of different places. You see it if you look at um, a cliff on next to the ocean, you see it. If you look at the banks on either side of a lake or even a little stream, there's a, a small stream on LR's campus between Eisenhower and Morgan dorms. And that stream shows undercutting of the slope if you actually look at it very carefully. So what's going on with undercutting? Erosion eats away at the lower part of a slope. So here we have a rock cliff and we have the ocean beating against it. The ocean is over time going to eat away at this lower portion of the cliff. And what that does is it takes away the support that's holding up the top of the cliff. And so now we have an overhang. So you're up here the water is down below, you have an overhang. Over time, the water makes this undercut deeper and deeper, and it will eventually become so deep that the overhang cannot be supported, and it will break off and fall down. Now, our example is for rock in the ocean, but it's just as applicable for um, the dirt on either side of the little creek in the median on the road between Morgan and Eisenhower dorm. Over time, the water eats away at the soil, and so the grass and uh, other soil above that level can't be supported, and it collapses in. With the case of a cliff, what this will do is it actually pushes the cliff back so that it is um, become smaller and smaller over time. And for a river, it just widens the river. The river becomes wider over time. So undercutting is really uh, 
important for moving large amounts of material because it, it takes away the support system. So again, the undercut is down here and over time the overhang falls off. Okay, let's move along. You can also have mass movement because of overloading the slope. You know that you can pile things too high and the pile becomes unstable and falls down. Maybe it's when you dump a pile of books on your desk, it doesn't stay upright for very long. Or for me, it's a load of laundry, maybe I'll take and dump out the hamper and sometimes things fall on either side. Well, loose material is just the same way. If you add too much to a slope, it can't support it and the material is going to move down. A third way that material moves is by va vibrations from earthquakes or explosions. So if you have an earthquake, landslides are a very common after effect of earthquakes. If you set off explosions, Certainly you'll blow away the rock that you intended, but you might also shake loose adjacent material. Addition of water is something that a lot of people don't think about, but is very significant. Water does two things to produce slips. Remember that's the movement of the material along the surface. We're not talking about flows, but slips, it adds weight. Water is heavy. Uh, a 16 ounce bottle of water weighs a pound. So uh, a gallon of milk weighs eight pounds because you and I know that the milk you drink is mostly water. So water adds weight. And again, a, a cliff or a surface can only support so much weight before it comes crashing down. It also reduces the internal cohesion. What does that mean? Well, a little bit of water can hold loose material together. Think of the beach and the three kinds of sand you see. There's the loose sand that you walk on between the parking lot and the hard packed sand that you encounter before you get to the water. So the loose sand doesn't have much water, if any, in it. The hard pack sand has a little bit of water. A little bit of water will act to glue the sand together. Um, the water molecules are attracted to each other and they'll help hold the sand together. Makes great sand for making sand castles. But you add too much water and instead of sticking together, the sand beca becomes um, very runny. And you see that again at the beach when you go from the hard packed sand into the sand that the water wave has just washed over. It's very loose and runny and you tried to scoop it up with your hands, it would just run right through your fingers. So in that case, too much water has reduced the internal cohesion. All right, so a little water is good, too much water is a bad thing. So some common types of mass wasting. One of my favorites is creep. I grew up in Florida and Florida is very flat and you don't see creep there. So when I first observed it in the mountains of North Carolina, I was amazed. So creep is the slow downhill movement of soil or any unconsolidated debris. So the, the dirt that you and I think of is on top of the rocks and it just slowly moves downhill over time. Usually it's a result of the repeated freezing and pushing up and then thawing of the soil and then gravity takes over. So if you look at the little drawing, we've got a tilted fence line, we've got tilted power poles and we've got tilted trees. So what's happened is we've got a hill so when the fence post is put in the ground, it's put in upright. When the power pole was put into place, it was put in upright. But over time, what will happen is water seeps down into the soil. It freezes and expands and pushes up. We call that frost heaving. And then that loose material that's left on the surface will get washed downhill by rain 
or just gravity will cause it to loosen from around things that are stuck in the soil. So it loosens on the downhill side of power lines, of fence lines, of even trees growing out of the ground. You also see it in the headstones, in cemeteries, that they loosen. And so when an item loses support on the downhill side, it tends to tilt in the downhill direction. So you have the fence posts tilted, the trees tilted, and the power lines tilted. So that was a graphic, but this is an actual photograph of a fence line in a hilly area. You can see the mountains and you can see the, the steep hill that this fence was put on. I promise you, when they put in these fence posts, they didn't put them leaning out like this. They were straight up and down. And over time, the soil on this downslope side has experienced frost heaving which is loose in the material. So instead of being straight up in town, over time, um, gravity has allowed the fence line to fall. Another thing we need to talk about is an earth flow. So if you add too much water to the soil, it becomes fluid. And this creates an earth flow if you're on a, an incline of any sort. Again, not so much on flat land, but an incline, you'll get an earth flow. And it's usually a result of too much water. So where the earth breaks away, it produces what's called a scarp. Scarps have an unusual shape and you can recognize them. So here's a photograph where it shows that this little chunk of soil of, of the overburden has broken away and you can see where it came from right here. This surface of rupture is the scarp and the material. So it started out here and then had too much water. It broke off. There weren't enough plants to anchor it in place. So it broke off and it moved downhill. And then it was stopped because there's a road right here, so there's a flat area to keep it from falling anymore. Here's another photograph showing you a very clear example of a scarp. This is the breakaway point, the curved scarp. You'll notice that they're always curved. They're always uh, have this concave shape or a moon shape if you want to, like the crescent moon. This breakaway point is always curved. It is never a straight line. So if you're in a really cold climate, not Hickory, North Carolina, and it's hilly, you can have solifluxion. So solifluxion is when you have a permafrost, so the bottom layer of the soil stays frozen year round, but the top layer freezes in the winter and thaws in the, the summertime. And what that means is that the top layer thaws out and gravity pulls it downhill, but the very bottom is being grabbed from underneath. So instead of breaking off and, and coming downhill like uh, we saw with the, the previous SARPs, it's held in place enough that it sort of rumples. It gives the earth a very wrinkled surface. Um, again, you have to have a hill and permafrost and then a freezing thawing cycle for you to see this. This is not a very good photograph, but you can see there's this series of little lumpy sort of um, sweeps of soil coming across this is an example of solifluxion. You, you tend to see it in places, again, with a permafrost, so that means, and hills. So Alaska might be a place you'd go look for this. Let's talk about mud flows for a second. So when water increases in your earth flow, it becomes a mud flow. Mud flows have a lot more water in them than earth flows do. This makes a very thick, viscous material, and a mud flow looks innocent. It just looks like fast-moving water, 
But the truth of the matter is they can lift up cars, they can lift up houses. If you get caught in a mud flow, you'll never get out of it. You, you can't navigate it the way you can just moving water. And so mud flows are very, very dangerous. You see them in places that have very little vegetation. So that would be a volcanic area or a very dry, arid region. Um, these two regions tend not to have very much vegetation and they tend to have loose soil. So when it does rain, it rains a lot and the material makes these mud flows. Whoops, overshot, I apologize. Let's talk about landslides. We have a couple of different ones to look at. You can have a rock slide if it's just the rock that breaks loose and slides downhill. If it happens really quickly, we call it an avalanche. There's a, you can see there's a link for a YouTube video. I will put this in the chapter assignment as a separate link so you can click on it and watch it. Uh, it's pretty impressive. But we see rock slides in Western North Carolina all the time in the springtime because over the course of the winter, frost wedging has uh, enlarged cracks in rocks and in the spring, usually it's at their maximum and the rocks will just break loose and fall off. But there's a lot of rock slides. You see avalanches if it happens really quickly. So sometimes our rock slides are in little bits and pieces. An avalanche would just be a large mass of material taking place very, very quickly. Slumps. So these about develop in an area where you have strong resistant rock on top of weaker rock. So the strong rock stays in place, but the weaker rock gets eaten away. You develop an undercut, the cliff breaks off, and you uh, move back in time and you get a new slump. Basically, you can think of, uh, again, the shoreline of a lake or the shoreline of a river or that rock from the very first page. Was it the very first page? Yes. It's this one where we have an undercut and an overhang and then the overhang falls down. So we can think of it like that. All right, where were we before I went back? So this is a cliff in California. And you maybe can't tell from these details, but this is a series of, of buildings that over time, this cliff, they didn't build these buildings right on the edge of the cliff. That was not their initial plan. This cliff used to have more land between it and the ocean down here. And you will notice there are a lot of rocks down here at the base. Those rocks are not the same rocks that you would find up here. They have brought them in to try to shield the cliff from the ocean. So what will happen is they'll pile up rocks to act as um, a barrier so that the ocean waves, instead of crashing on the cliff and creating an undercut, they crash on these rocks and the rocks reduce the power of the wave thereby protecting the cliff. The problem is it looks like they started this a little late. There are lots of places in California where they didn't realize it was a problem until six feet of cliff broke off and fell down into the ocean and then they tried to salvage things. And sometimes it's just not possible. We'll have a video of, of cliffs collapsing for you to watch in, uh, again, a link for a YouTube video will be in the assignment. Here is an example of, you can see they've got a tarp out. Again, this house was not originally built right there on the very edge. What has happened is over time, it's, it's fallen off. You can see here, there's a patio. And again, this is just right even. They had, it looks like they had put support materials, maybe they drilled down and had support systems in place in the rock before they built the house. But what they neglected to do was um, do something about the base of the cliff. And so over time, the base of the cliff has just been beaten on by the water and um, 
we, we've just got tremendous erosion. So the cliff has receded over time. Water is going to win. I, I say this numerous times during the semester. The water is going to win. You can do things, but the water is relentless and it is going to eat away and re relocate large amounts of rock and soil and everything you do is only temporary. So if you have a beachfront house, if you have a house on a cliff overlooking the ocean, if you have a house on the lake or a river, be prepared for flooding and for erosion to take uh, be a major part of your life. So that was in Isla Vista, California. That's where this photograph is from. All right, debris slides, falls, and avalanches. These just involve the overburden. That's why the word debris is in place. Um, a slide moves along the surface, a fall moves through the air, and an avalanche happens quickly. And so that's how you differentiate between the three. Look at this little graphic of the anatomy of a mudslide. You can see that there is rain, so water gets into the soil and makes it flow and you're on an incline so it flows downhill. The um, loose material, if it's flowing, has enough power behind it to pick up large boulders and they in turn, as they come downhill, can completely cover and destroy a house or even break it off its foundation and carry it away. Uh, a lot of times people know, oh, gee, I don't want to build my house on the slope. It's going to fall off one day. I'll just be down here at the base. But it's, it can be very dangerous to be at the base of a mountain that's subject to mudslides. So just want to look at all the factors. Here is a photograph showing this is a housing development down here again at the base of a mountain you can see all the trees and i know it's a very poor quality photo but you see this area in the middle when there are no trees that used to have vegetation and then what happened is there was a mudslide and a huge amount of the overburden broke off and under tremendous force came down and just buried the central portion of this housing area. And so all of these houses are completely covered in mud. It is horrific. Here's an example of a highway in Taiwan that experienced a landslide. Again, rain and the land breaks off and the next thing you know it has just moved across, in this case, um, multiple lanes. So what, there's about three there and six and seven and eight, so about eight lanes. And that finishes our discussion.